right? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord. You got a thankful heart tonight, amen, that Jesus made a way. Praise God. Jesus made a way so that you could know the Lord, so that you could experience God's presence. And, you know, if we're not experiencing God's presence, then, you know, it's not God's fault. Amen. Um, I know that God wants us to be able to experience his presence. He loves us so much that he made a way that we could enter into worship with him and to have a personal relationship with him. So anyway, I just thank y'all for coming tonight. We still got a lot of people sick, uh, people that praise God. As far as I know, they're not so sick that they're really sick, but, but they're trying to, I guess, be respectful, you know, for, uh, to, to try to stay away so that they don't get anyone else sick. So praise God. All right. So last week we talked about righteousness and we talked about the righteousness of God. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to review that here in a moment. But tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about the sinful nature. Okay. I think this is an important concept for us to understand, especially, um, you know, in, in the church world that we live in, a lot of times people are looking for certain answers. You know, like I've been experiencing a lot of things lately connected to deliverance ministry, you know, and, um, and listen, I just got to be honest with you. Like I'm kind of always excited to look into things and to dig deep and to, and to learn from other people because sometimes we can get blinded in our, in, in, in our walk because we think we, sometimes we can think we got all the answers is what I'm trying to say, right? But, there, but there's one thing that I definitely believe with all of my heart that the Lord has given me some answers out of his word. And one of the answers that I feel like the Lord has shown me in the word of God is that a problem for the believer. That, that cannot find himself or herself walking in the victory. See, Jesus promised that we, could, that we would have victory. Jesus, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so if anybody's really a discerning mind or wants to kind of question things, they may would ask, okay, Jesus, so in your opinion, what is truth? Right? A lot of people are searching for truth, right? Even Pontius Pilate, when he was about to give the decree to go ahead and just crucify him, he what did he do? He went over there and he was washing his hands and 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 there was a concept about truth, and Jesus said something about truth, and, and Pontius Pilate said, What is truth? You saw a lot of people are questioning and asking, what is truth? truth, right? And so I got to tell you that I believe that what Jesus had a specific thing in mind, he was talking about the truth of who he was and the work that he was coming to do. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So now there may be many people in here tonight that, or, you know, maybe a few people in here tonight that would say, okay, well, I'll buy, I'll buy that. I believe Jesus is the truth because he said that. Jesus said that himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said that no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, I didn't plan on saying this, but every time I quote that scripture, I can't help myself. I've had many conversations with people of different religions. I've had many conversations with Muslims that mean well when I'm talking to them. And one of the things that they always say is, oh, no, we believe that Jesus was a great prophet. We just don't believe that he was the Son of God. We don't believe that that was the Jesus, the prophet that died on the cross. They believe some little switcheroo took place right there at the last second before Jesus breathed out his breath. But, you know, every demonic spirit and every lying doctrine will always try to take away from the person of Christ who he was. Was, number one, he was deity in, wrapped in human flesh. Amen. He was God that became man. Amen. And they will also try to denigrate or, or to take away from the work of the cross. And so whenever that person said that, at least on two different occasions, two different Muslims told me that, what I said was that can't be true. That's not true. You cannot sit here and tell me that you believe that Jesus is a great prophet. It doesn't work. W w what are you talking about? Because, see, my Bible says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So if you're trying to say that you're going to get to God another way, whether it's through Prophet Muhammad or whatever you think you're going to do, then, then what we're saying is Jesus is a liar. And he's not telling the truth. And if Jesus is a liar, according to your religion, now I didn't get this loud whenever I told him, but I'm getting loud now. And if Jesus is a liar, then he can't be a great prophet. So it's either one or the other. Either Jesus is saying that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, or Jesus didn't say it at all. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus said it. It's recorded in Scripture. I got good news for you tonight. If you want to get to the Father, you can get there. You, you got to get there through Jesus, though. 
And guess what? Whenever you get born again and you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're going to talk a lot about being born again tonight because can I tell you something that nothing that I'm going to talk to you tonight about is going to work if you're not born again. Is it, I, I can sit here. You may not even understand what I'm trying to tell you if you're not born again. But I got good news. You can be born again. As a matter of fact, you don't even need me to lay hands on you. You can go straight to the Lord yourself. And you can say, right now, Lord, I want to be born again. Well, what does it even mean to be born again? Well, first of all, let me just say this. When a person is born the first time from their mother, they're born like their father, Adam. Okay, what are you, what are you trying to say? Well, that's why I got this lady to to make this little thing for me. I thought it was always cool. Rest in peace, Adam. The old man, the, the person that you were born, let me let the people look if anybody's gonna watch. The person that you were born whenever you were born of your mother, what does this mean? It means that you inherited a nature from your father. Well, my daddy's name wasn't Adam. Well, no, in reality it was. I mean, my daddy's name was Jim, and whatever your daddy's name is, you can fill in the blank. But if we go backwards from Jim to Sydney to blah, 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 and we work it all the way back, the father of the human race is Adam. Yes, God created Adam. And I want you to know, the Bible says that when God created Adam, he created him in his image and in his likeness. But I want you to see the scripture right here because, you see, at some point in time, the serpent came and he deceived Eve, right? We know that story. And then, then Eve got Adam to be partake in, in this deception. And, and then what happened was Adam and Eve at that point in time knew that something was wrong with them. They realized that something had changed on the inside of them. Now, I got a flip reversal for you. I want you to know something. Good news you will also know when something changes on the inside of you towards the Lord. You will know it. Whenever the Lord moves in into your heart, you will know it, my friend. Or are you trying to tell me, preacher, I ain't never going to mess up again? No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, you will know you are not the same person that you are now before you invited Christ into your heart and in your life. And it may not even always show up like you expect it to, but you will. Your life will start to change. Your, your mindsets will start to change. It might be poquito, just a little bit, poquito el dia, just a little bit every day. I don't know if I said it right, but it's something like that. Look, Chris looks at Yvette. How did he do, babe? He didn't do good, babe, but guess what? A, a Hispanic person would have understood what I was saying. Poquito el dia, righteousness, verdad, tr truth, a little bit every day. A little bit every day will change you on the inside. It ain't got to be good. This is gringo espanol, my friend. Yeah, that's what it is. It's gringo espanol. All right. So a little bit of truth every day will change you on the inside. Amen? All right. So look what happened after Adam lived 130 years. So Adam was created out of the dust of the earth or the clay of the uh, earth. God breathed his life-giving spirit into Adam, made him a living soul. Then Adam and Eve fall, and guess what? The first birth that we hear about in the book of Genesis after the fall of Adam. This is, I'm not trying to say that Cain and Abel weren't born after the fall because they obviously were. But what I'm trying to say is, is that the first birth that, well, it's not true. It, the, the birth of Cain was recorded in that Eve was given a son of the Lord. But, this, but I want you to know that we're given more information about the birth of Seth. And now this is after Cain killed his brother Abel. And this next child that was born to Adam and Eve is named Seth. And I want you to see what it says. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. What is your point, preacher? My point is, is that when God created Adam out of the dirt, he was created in the image and likeness of God. Amen? And so mankind, in that sense, has been created in the image and likeness of God. But that, because of the fall, that when man is now born, he reflects also the image of his father Adam. Does that make sense? So there's something that's on the inside of you and I now, each and every one of us. You know, sometimes people show up in a church and they're like, man, that preacher mentioned the word sin too much. It makes me feel weird. Hold on a second, my friend, because this is the thing. We all born of Adam. We're all born in sin. We all have a sinful nature. So if the word sin is aggravating you, it ought to be aggravating me just as much because we all got the same problem. 
Sin is the problem. Listen, let us not ever grow weary of hearing the word sin preached in a church. <laughs> because if we can't say the word sin in a church anymore, where have we gone as a world? Where have we gone as a nation? What, 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 are, what are we doing? Because guess what? God bankrupted heaven, and the answer for sin was giving us his precious son, Jesus, who had to die naked on a cross amongst ridicule. No, I, got, now I need you to understand this. Because, see, we just read the Bible and we just keep moving. But for that period of time, he was hung on the cross. At 9 a.m., he was taken off the cross. At 3 p.m., the Bible explicitly says people walked by, wagged their head, laughed at him, scoffed at him, told him, why can't you get yourself down off of that cross? And there he bled, hanging naked, bleeding, sweating. And, and you know what he says in his heart? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The world doesn't want God, but guess what? There's people in the world that if they see God in you and I, they will receive God. And that was another thing. Whenever we were singing that song and it said, King of glory, well, whatever that one was, your overall creation, your, how great you are, okay? One of those things, that, and it, I might have went into the next song when y'all started singing about Jesus. And one of those songs, the name of Jesus was coming out. I can't remember all the lyrics, I'm sorry. But whenever I was starting to think about the name of Jesus and I was thinking about how God has had to, to take me down a pathway to where I would sing from my heart the truth that how great you are, that you're over, 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 that you're over. Thank you, Lord, that you finally brought me to a place where I just don't have to move my lips to words that are on the screen. But then that word Jesus, and I started thinking, you know how bad people are hurting out there? People hide it well. They try to hide it. We all try to hide it. Look, this earth is painful, my friend. I don't care how strong you think you are, how tough you think you are. I don't care how much you think you don't care or, or whatever. No, this earth is hard. Life is hard. Why? Because it's fallen. The Bible teaches us that the earth is fallen. The whole creation is groaning because something is missing because it's not right. It's not right because of the fall of man. It's not right because of the sinful nature. It's not right because man that was created in the image and likeness of God that was created for the purpose of having dominion upon the earth went the wrong way and allowed sin to come into himself. And now the entirety of the human race is born in the image and likeness of Adam with a sinful nature and therefore they hurt even those that they love. And that's why the Bible says you must be born again. In order to be able to see God, have a relationship with God, you must be born again. And when you get born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. And he begins to, you become, the Bible says in the letter that, that Peter wrote, you become a partaker of the divine nature. The divine nature, God himself, comes to live on the inside of you. So what does it even mean to be born again? It means that you got to come to the realization that you need Jesus. It's a real simple message. you got to come to the realization that wherever you've been in life, even though, listen, sometimes things we do in life are fun, and we're not going to sit here and be ridiculous. Sometimes things in our flesh that we've done have been fun until they had their way with us, right? Until we served them to the point where they caused pain and heartache. And then many times we wish we would have never done whatever those things were because they left us empty, right? And I was thinking about the name Jesus and about singing a song that says you're over all of creation and how, how badly people need to hear that name, you know? Like, I'm just saying, like, I hope by the grace of God that I would be able to because see that name is worthy. I know that it seems weird and it makes people feel uncomfortable. I get that. Because, listen, I wasn't always this gung-ho for Jesus. There's a time in my life when I wasn't really gung-ho for Jesus at all. As a matter of fact, when I first got saved, I thought Christians were weird. I thought Christian music was weird. I was like, dude, you're, like, making me feel weird. But now I just want to say it. I, I, want, I wish I could just, I would, there's a part of me that wants to go home and grab my cross and go walk down the street again. <laughs> 
As weird as that was, I know that makes some of y'all feel weird. I get it. Oh my gosh, he's a nurse practitioner. He's a pastor of a church. Why is he walking down the street carrying a cross and moving his lips like that? Because he feels a little bit humiliated. Because his pride is being killed as he walks down the street knowing that the very people that are looking at him, some of them are laughing and some of them are ridiculing. Why? Because he would have done the same to them. He would have probably thrown an egg and hit the cross. He probably would have spit a loogie on them or as weird and gross as that is. He probably would have maybe not thrown a beer bottle because I'm not trying to hurt nobody like that. But he would have done something. He would have laughed. He would have rolled the window down. Hey, you fool. What are you doing? But I got to tell you, I, don't even, I didn't plan on saying any of that. I got to tell you the first time I grabbed that cross and started walking down the the street. You think what you want and started praying in the spirit because, listen, it was different, dude. It's like my flesh was starting to die. I'm not trying to tell you you got to grab a cross and walk down the street for your flesh to die. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm giving you an object lesson that people need to hear the name of Jesus. And I hope and pray that God, because what I was trying to say is, is that his name is worthy to be spoken of in public places. Jesus owns this earth. It belongs to him. It was his before he became man. He became man so he could die to redeem, to pay back through his blood, his sinless blood, to pay back and to buy the souls of men and give them back to God. That's what Jesus came to do. So his name is worthy to be spoken in public places. I don't really care how weird people think I am. I don't really care if they think I'm ridiculous. I don't care if you think I'm ridiculous. I'm here to tell you Jesus is worthy. And you might see me. Well, as a matter of fact, I've been thinking a lot about that cross lately. When I, was, when I was a drunk, a pothead, and just a fornicator, and had no hope, and left empty, and somebody had the willingness to say Jesus to me. And you know how long it took me to bow my knee because all of these stupid mindsets and the way that the world views things, and it's like, okay, you know, even my own dad, you can, you know, hey, look, <laughs> I love Jesus too, man, but you can go a little bit too far with all this religion stuff. I don't mean to be rude, Dad, but you don't even know what you're talking about, man. You don't talk about being an offensive lineman. Okay, you might have some credibility, but you ain't got no t- nothing to say about being a born-again Christian. Okay, I'm going to change my story here in a second because I'm going on too long with all this, but i never forget this was good. <clears throat> my dad said that one time at the table at my sister's house. Hey, y'all can go a little too far with this religion stuff. And my sister said, Dad, I was sitting next to you at a football game in Allen, in Bryan, Texas, when Matt was at military school. And he was playing in a football game. And you had just gotten your false teeth. And he sacked the quarterback and caused a fumble. And you yelled so loud that your teeth flew out of your mouth. And you snatched them out the air and stuck them back in your mouth. And you made a joke that you had to get a safety chain for your teeth. You were so excited about football that you lost your teeth. But whenever people start talking about Jesus, you get all clammed up and you feel uncomfortable. No, no, Dad. Jesus is worthy. (laughs) Jesus is worthy to be celebrated. He's worthy to have his name spoken of in public places. Jesus is worthy for us to lay our life down. Because listen, my friend, he's bringing hope. I'm telling you right now, just buy in. Buy into what I'm telling you and surrender and start to call out on the name of Jesus and to, and, and to pray, amen, and ask the Lord to touch your heart and your life, amen? All right, listen, real quick, we're going backwards a little bit. We talked about, we talked about Romans chapter 3 last week because we talked about righteousness. You remember that? And so I want to I remind you a little bit. We didn't go through all of these scriptures. I'm, I'm transitioning into the sinful nature tonight, and we're going to finish that up, but this goes back to Romans chapter 3. Now, I need you to know in the first three chapters of the book of the letter written to the Romans by the apostle Paul, he, in chapter 1, he says, in chapters 1 through 3, he's trying to reassure everyone that we're all guilty. 
Does that make sense? Like, he's like, literally, everybody's guilty. Like, the, the Gentiles are guilty. That means other nations that don't know God. And the Jews are guilty because they ain't doing it right. Okay. And so he just want, he wants everybody to know, no, we're all guilty. That's why we needed Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. So sometimes the good news starts off with bad news. Bad news, we're all guilty. Good news, God has an answer. His name is Jesus. Amen? All right. So what then are we better than they? He's talking to the Jews now. No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Again, born in the image and likeness of your father, Adam, born in sin, all right? And then he goes on to explain it in a little bit more detail. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. See, meaning left to ourselves. I don't care if your name is Gandhi. I don't care if your name, and I'm not making fun of him. I'm just saying. I don't care if, you know, I heard Gandhi said this one time. If it weren't for Christians, I'd probably be one. Ha! <laughs> Uh-oh. What, what, why you mean, what you mean, Gandhi? Why you want to say that? Because they don't act like Jesus. If they're the representatives of him, I don't want to be like that. I mean, I read the stories of him and what he did. Anyway, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand. There is none that seek after God. Listen, separate from the Holy Spirit working in your life, don't wake up tomorrow thinking you the answer for everybody. You know, oh, I'm God's appointed man for the hour. No, had the Lord not ministered to you and moved by his spirit on your heart, you would not have woke up today desiring to seek him. Amen? We can all accept that, right? I hope. It says, they have all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, not one. And look, this is another thing. There are people that try to do good on earth. That's not what, there's people that try to do good on earth. But in the end, many times whenever people are even trying to do good, the motives of what they're doing are impure because they're trying to get something else on the back end. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Jesus Jesus was already God in heaven, and he allowed himself to be lowered. That's what the book of Hebrews says, for the point so that he could die and die the death of a cross, which was the most horrendous death during that time. He goes on to talk about these people, and he says, their throat is an open sepulcher. That's another, it's an old King James word for a tomb. Their throat is a tomb or a grave. With their tongues, they have used deceit, the poison of asps, is under their lips. Mm. Lord, help us. Help us not to use our mouth to cause pain. Help us, amen, help us not to be gossips. Help us not to be liars. Lord, help us to allow our lips to proclaim the beautiful name of Jesus and to bring hope, amen, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace Have they not known? People are hurting. We talked about that. They're out there and they're wandering around. You know, I was looking at this scripture. I had, y'all remember the story? I preached about it a while back. Whenever the apostle Paul went to Corinth, I believe it was. I believe it was Corinth. I'm shooting from the hip here, so forgive me if I got it wrong. But remember when he walked up that pathway and there were all these gods, all these statues. And then he starts to, he gets up on Mars Hill. That place is still there today. People still go there and, and they remember. But all the philosophers, the Greek philosophers would get up there and they would all sit there and just talk all this intelligent type stuff. Everybody wanted to sound so smart. The Apostle Paul said, look, I noticed that you had this one little statue thing to this unknown God. That's the one I want to talk to you about. You seem to know all the other ones. Let me introduce you to the one that you don't know. But in part of that message when he was preaching it, the King James Version says that God would want that they would grope for him. That's that's kind of like an old word that probably has changed meaning. But the idea is, is that they're blind. Some translations say feel for him. The idea is that they're blind and they're feeling around. People are, people are walking around spiritually blind, and they're feeling around, and they don't even realize it, but they're looking for God. All of this stuff that they put on the inside of them, whatever that is. I was driving down the road on the way to church today, and I saw this lady on a bicycle. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, like, I'm not trying to be, I love people. I do. I don't, I'm not going to have to go through all the whole story to tell you, to try to convince you. I just hope you believe that I love people. Anyway, she's on this bicycle, and it's obvious that life has had its way with her. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, do I need to go into all the details? I'm not going to go into all the details. I don't have to describe all of that. It's obvious. Life has wore her down. 
Sin has taken its toll on this woman's life. And she's writing, and, and because my air conditioner is broke, I got my windows down. And so she's riding on this bicycle, and I can hear when she passes by, she kind of got like a little boombox thing connected to her bicycle somewhere. And she, I don't even know what she's listening to, but she's listening to some kind of music. And in that moment, she's like, she's all up in the moment. You know what I'm saying? Like she's like twisting her head and she's singing and her lips are moving. And I thought to myself, dude, people are looking for stuff. And li listen, I, I don't want to get into the whole topic of music right now. That's not my point. My point is that little song, that little lyric, whatever that was, removed her from her reality. For a short period of time. For a short period of time, she's singing this song, and it's, I hate to say it, but it's doing something to her spirit. And she's forgetting her surroundings and her circumstances. She ain't happy. Trust me. Trust me. Life has beat her down. I know it. I don't have to talk to her. I can see it. Driving down the road, life has beat her down. But in that one little moment, she's looking for something to fill the void. She's searching through life to fill the void. And if it's not that, it's probably some other stuff that have caused her to appear the way she appears today. And guess what? She'll probably go get some more of that stuff, whatever it is tonight. She might go back tomorrow. I don't know. But she's going to keep searching and looking for something to fill the void that's on the inside. And the whole time, like Paul said, he wishes that they would feel around for him. They're groping around. They're walking in darkness and they're feeling around. And then God said, I wish that they would look for my son Jesus that I that I sent and as they're groping around in life the hope and the prayer is, is that somebody somewhere will say that name Jesus out loud and somebody will reach up and they'll grab it and they'll grab it and they'll hold it and they'll embrace it and they'll say yes Lord yes that's what I want that's what I've been looking for I've been looking for you Lord amen thank you Jesus so guess what don't be stingy with the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Give it to people. Praise God. So look, the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And this is the part I wanted to bring you to. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What is he talking about? The law and the prophets are another way to describe the Old Testament. All right? The Old Testament. You with me? The law is the first five books of the Bible. The prophets, there are several prophets. So that's just describing the Old Testament. He's saying that the Old Testament passages witnessed or told the testimony of the righteousness that was to come. Does that make sense? So the righteousness that was to come, he had a name. His name is Jesus. Look what it says right here. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. How? Through the redemption that it is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means you've been bought back with a price. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation. We're going to talk about that word a little bit later. Through faith in his blood. Through faith in his blood. See, you can't just believe in Jesus the teacher. You can't just believe in Jesus the miracle worker. You have to, no, really, Jesus the sacrifice is the answer for the sickness of mankind. And the pain and the heartache that he experienced through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So I want you to see that tonight, that when we were talking about righteousness, that the righteousness of God, look what he said right here. He said, he said, look, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. The righteousness of God has been manifest. Now, I, want, I, I would love to have a church where people were doing righteous acts, right? Good things. Being kind to other people. Giving. Considerate, right? But God has a righteousness. And his righteousness has a name. And his name is Jesus. 
And whenever that righteousness is spoken and people receive it by faith, that righteousness comes to live on the inside of them. And now God begins to see that person as righteous, not based on what you do, not based on what you did, whether it was good or bad, based on your faith based on the fact that God sent his son, Jesus, the righteousness of God that was spoken of in the Old Testament, and you heard it, and you believed it by faith, and when you did, the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart, amen, and now that just is the beginning. That's kind of like if you just introduced yourself. Hello, President Trump, my name's Matt Abair, or whatever, you know, you just shake the hand. How how you doing, son? Where you from? You know, whatever. Okay, now I know President Trump. You don't know President Trump. He's just... You got a little introduction. You shook his hand. Or whoever, Biden, if Biden's your guy, okay. If Biden's your guy, you shook Biden's hand. How you doing, President Biden, or whatever. He's like, did I ever meet you before? No, I didn't. I didn't. Lord, forgive me. That was not, that was probably not of the Lord. Lord, help President Biden. Help his brain. All right, anyway. All right, so the Lord will help you. But you know what? No, because it's, it's wickedness. I'm not going to, do I need to really apologize as wickedness? People are wicked. And, they, and, they, and they're, paying a, they're paying a penalty. The man's wicked. I'm not going to get into all his wickedness, but he's wicked. So anyway, it is what it is. All right. Leaders of the earth, wickedness. So the righteousness of God is, has a name. His name is Jesus. Amen? All right. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get into, now another thing I wanted to share with you is we're talking about the righteousness of God, and we're talking about Abraham. So what shall we say then, Abraham our father has found according to his flesh? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. So in other words, you can't work hard enough in the kingdom of God to please God. Does that make sense? Because some religions are based on work. I was born and raised Catholic. All right. I mean, and that's why I feel like I can talk about it if I want to, because that's what I was. Mama sent me to catechism. Right. I don't know what I learned over there, but they, she did send me to catechism. All right. And, and, and I went through the process. But listen, the Catholic religion is based on a work system. You, you do things. You pay for indulgences. You pay penance. You, you pay for certain prayers to be prayed for people to be able to get out of purgatory and various things like that. It's a works-based system. The Bible specifically says that Abraham, what did Abraham do? No, look at this right here. He believed God. You see that? He believed God, and then righteousness was put into his account. So I want to tell you that the righteousness of God is Jesus, and when you hear the gospel story preached about this righteousness of God, and you receive it by faith, then what happens is God puts righteousness into your account. And who is, how does he put righteousness into your account? Because the spirit of righteousness comes to live on the inside of you. Amen? I hope, I hope that makes some sense. Now, to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you could earn favor with God, then you just go out there and you work it, right? You owe me, Lord. I done put in five hours this week. (laughs) Come on. You know, like, come on, boss man. I done punched the clock. I did my job. Come on. Give me some of that grace. Give me some of that righteousness. I earned it. No, 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 no. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, there's a whole lot that I just said right there, but just to kind of make it simple, you need some help from the Lord. Lord, I know I can't earn favor from you, but I'm going to believe that you can give me what I need in order to walk with you. It's real simple. Real simple prayer. Lord, I can't do it. Lord, I surrender. Huh? I surrender, Lord. I can't do it. I need you to do it in me. Do the work in me, Lord. I surrender to you. Amen? Hopefully that makes some sense. All right, now, in Romans 5, because remember, we talked about righteousness quite a bit. And in Romans 5, I'm not going to get into all these words, but I just wanted to bring a point to you. I said this. I said, look at this. This is one good little verse. I didn't talk about it. But God commends or shows his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It, that, that ought to be, that ought to, kind of minister to your heart a little bit because what I'm trying to say is you know the devil he works overtime (laughs) 
You know what I'm saying? Like he is definitely punching the clock. He's working overtime. And what he's working overtime to do is to convince you that you're unworthy. Y'all know what I'm talking about? He's going to convince you. He's going to remind you of all the stuff you did. <laughs> you know, I'm not, if, if, you, if you think that I'm talking about you, I'll probably am using you as an example, but I'm not going to say your name. But sometimes people, whenever they get ready to come to church, they feel like they're unworthy to walk into the church. We all unworthy, my friend. <laughs> if it wouldn't be for Jesus, ain't none of we did lightning bolts would have struck so much this whole place would be singed and burned down. Right? No. So, so what I'm trying to say is, is, that, is that God showed his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Jesus died for us. So when we were our worst, Jesus already knew what he was doing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you think about it, like, Lord, why would you die for old whatever like me? Because I love you, man. And I want you to come to me. Amen? All right. So, but this is what I really wanted you to see. I want you to see, I told you this last time, but look, see that word gift right there? And that every time this word gift is being used, it's, co- it's uh, comparing or contrasting the f- sin of Adam with the sacrifice of Jesus, if you could say it like that. Okay, and it's all connected to righteousness, right? So born of Adam, I was born in sin. Born again in Christ, I received the gift. Now, he doesn't tell you what the gift is until you get to verse 17. But you see, gift one, gift two, gift three, gift four. And here it is right here in verse 17. For if by one man's offense, talking about the the sin of Adam, if by one man's sin, death reigned. You see that word reigned there, it's like a king. By one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus. See, you can't work for it. It's a gift. I was, I think Castellanos had a little sign up, something about freedom, had a Statue of Liberty sign up. He said, freedom ain't free. Righteousness isn't free. Oh, it's a free gift to you and me, and we can receive it. I think last week I talked about the ATM, punch your pin in, which is faith in Christ, and receive your disbursements. So Jesus already died for everybody's righteousness. He died for everybody. He died for those two Muslim people that I was talking about earlier that I had a conversation with. It's just that right now they're not buying, they're not buying into the Jesus, but I hope and pray that by saying that name and telling the story that the Lord will minister to their heart and not let them sleep, 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 let them sleep. Bear with you. Now, last week I ended, and we really need to work more on this, but I just want to share with you real quick to remind you, we're going to need to work more with this slide. We're not going to cover it all tonight, but righteousness, that gift of righteousness is, is like a right standing before God. Like in other words, you and I, born of Adam, were born guilty. Born guilty in Adam and full of sin, we're not in right relationship with God. Does that make sense? I hope it does because some people will be like, oh, but it's not my fault what Adam did. Yeah, but you already threw your ante into the pot, my friend. You got up, bellied up to the poker table, and you threw your ante in to get in the game. Have you not? Yes, you have. At some point in time, every last one of us has thrown our ante into the pot, right? That's an affirmative. This is a negative. Okay, don't shake your head no, because that wouldn't be true. I don't care how good you are. You, you was born like Adam, and you done some of that Adam stuff. That's why you must be born again. All right, so when you received Christ Jesus, your Lord, you were given the gift of righteousness. And again, the Bible teaches that we have been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. So that's our position now. In God's mind, the way he sees us is that we are in Christ. Does that make sense? I know, like, I used to draw it all the time on the board, but let me just go ahead and draw it now, all right? So, so in Christ, this would be you born the first time like Adam, okay? You're dead, you're broken, right? You could say that's a pretty bad case of scoliosis, but there's actually a scripture that talks about that, an untoward world, and the word untoward is scoliosis. It's where we get the word scoliosis. Curved and crooked. Just because you got scoliosis don't mean you're crooked. Okay, I'm just trying to make a point. So born the first time like Adam, right? And then God sent us Jesus. All right, that's Jesus' crown of thorns right there. All right? And he got arms because he's got nail-pierced hands. 
And then somebody told you the good news of the gospel, and you put faith in Jesus Christ. Faith, that's what those arrows are. Faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. If you're saved tonight, if you're not saved, you can get saved. Amen? But if you're saved tonight or born again, let's, use, let's explain what we're talking about, then you put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. You don't even have to understand all this stuff I'm trying to explain to you, but that's what I do. I'm a teacher, so I'm trying to explain stuff for people to know what they're actually believing in. But you don't even have to have a teacher like me that just dissects everything down to the nitty-gritty detail. All you need to do is, like, know that you ain't right where you are and that you need some help down here. And if you call on the name of Jesus and you say, yes, Lord, I'll believe in you, guess what? He will move in. And he knows there ain't no trickery with the Lord. The Lord, 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 the Lord. Lord. The Lord knows. He sees through all of that. So when you mean business with the Lord, I'm telling you, he will move in and he will do work and he will take the scalpel and he will do surgery on our heart and he will change us. And you'll know something spiritual will happen to you because you ain't never going to be the same. I'm not trying to say you ain't never going to mess up. I'm not. You get the point I'm trying to make, right? All right. When you put your faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, guess what happened? The Lord puts you in Christ. I'm talking about position right now. See, and the guy, I used to draw it like this. These would be like the eyes of God. I'm going to do my best not to make him look cross-eyed. The eyes of God looking at man. He, listen, I, if I don't get nothing else across to you tonight, I need you to understand this spiritual revelation. When God the Father is looking, he's not looking over here at this. If you're a, a born-again believer. If you're a born-again believer, he's not looking at this. He's looking at this. What is he looking at? He's looking at the righteousness of God. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Well, what are you talking about? I messed up. Like He's looking at the righteousness of God. His name is Jesus. He's looking at Jesus. And listen, what a deal. <laughs> what, what a beautiful deal that God provided for mankind that you can't save yourself. You can't work up a big enough paycheck to pay me back for all of the wrong that Adam did and everybody did, but I'm going to send you a free gift. His name is Jesus. He was the righteous one. He never sinned. He only did what I asked him to do. He only said what I asked him to say. He did what I asked him to do. He only said what he heard me say. He only did what he saw me do, and he died on the cross in sacrificial death, and you believed it. You believed it like Abraham, the father of faith. And because you believed it, righteousness was placed into your account. <laughs> That's your position. Unfortunately, every last one of us in this room, our condition is inferior or below our position, right? In other words, we all got growing to do. So that's why I put the little arrow like that. Because walking with Christ is going to let, at, at, as each day goes on, I could probably actually should have made a stairway. Because it's one step at a time, one day at a time. He's changing us. I want you to be encouraged that even though you don't feel like you've grown like you needed to grow, I want you to know that, you're, that if you stay plugged into Jesus, you will grow. Sometimes it happens fast. Sometimes it happens slow. Now, what do we call that? We call that progressive, meaning it's a journey. It's a little bit at a time. Sanctification. What does sanctification mean? It's a fancy church where, you know what it means? To be separated and to be holy. Now, <laughs> if he's just like, oh, preacher, you got the wrong guy. I'm not talking about your holiness. <laughs> Thank God I'm not talking about my holiness. Thank God I'm talking about his holiness. I'm talking about Jesus' holiness. Amen. So when you get saved, your position now is in Christ, and now God sees you as holy because of him. And now guess what? He's separated you out from this sinful world in Christ. And guess what? As he slowly changes you through progressive sanctification, meaning you're, you're looking more like Jesus and less like the world, then guess what? Your own life starts to look separated from the world around you. That, dude, now that's good stuff right there. You see, that's the Holy Spirit doing it in you. He's changing. Changing your heart, changing your mindset. Now, listen, if you're anything like me, you're going to fight along the way. You will, because your nature of Adam does not want to just give in. 
You're going to fight. And guess what? You won't be the first one to put up a fight. And guess what? The Lord loves you. If you're saved tonight, the Lord loves you so much. Amen. He ain't going to quit. And he's going to win. He will win. The best thing you and I can do is like they do in MMA. And don't, you don't have to take a beat in that bag. You can just tap out. I tap, Lord. I surrender. You know? I, I mean, okay, anyway, I don't want to keep preaching on that. Because I'm telling you, I done seen some fights sometimes. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Like, how this dude ain't quitting. But, you know, and it's one thing to think, I guess if you're an MMA star, that's a good thing. He ain't quitting because he ended up coming back and winning the fight. At the, who would have ever dreamed in a million years with his lips flapping all over the place? Oh, my gosh. But it's a horrible thing not to quit in the hands of the Lord. <laughs> I'm not going to quit. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to endure. I'm going to keep doing it my way just like Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Uh, how did that work out for you, Frankie boy? All right. So listen, this let us understand that we're all being changed into the image of the Lord. All right, so now what we're trying to talk about tonight in the le- next nine minutes or 11 minutes is the sinful nature. So this Romans 5, 21, it's a concept I want to talk to you about tonight, the sinful nature. Born in Adam, you were born in the image and likeness of your father Adam. The, the, the nature of sin that we receive from our father Adam. It says that as sin has reigned. Now that word sin there, I'm going to break it down a little bit more. It's a noun. It's a noun in the Greek language. I'm not trying to teach you Greek language. I'm not. Don't get all caught up in it. But I need you to understand. Why would you even say that then, preacher? Because when people think about sin, what do they normally think about? verbs of sin. What are you trying to talk about? What is a verb? Somebody shout it out there. Somebody didn't have a college action. Thank you. Action words, right? What, what kind of action words? Well, you can fill in the blank. There's a whole lot of blanks we can fill in. All right? I mean, what is it? Uh, doing drugs? Uh, fornicating? Uh, you know, what does fornication mean? Sex outside of marriage? Um, you know, okay, let's, let's just get rid of that stuff. That's the easy stuff. Uh, I mean, obviously, that it's not right. Um, okay, gossip and tongues. Lying tongues. Improper motives in the heart that nobody else sees. I just kind of hope that old boy don't, don't get it done, and I hope he loses his job, and I can take his position. Dude, that's, that ain't the Lord. That's not God. That's bad stuff right there, my friend. That's bitterness. That's poison from Satan, okay? All right, so the sinful nature, though, in this passage is reigning. The idea behind reigned is that it's like a king. So the sinful, the sinful nature that you and I receive from Adam can rule and reign as a king in our life. All right. And it starts to, you know what a, you know what a king does in his kingdom? He tells people what to do. And if they don't do it, then, then, he, then there's repercussions. Okay. So I just want you to see sin as a noun is really talking about something bigger than just verbs of sin. See, in other words, it's the source or the power that drives a person towards sin. Does that make sense? It's like a factory that produces sin. It's like a, it's, it's pumping out sin, all right? And so it says that as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life, by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I didn't put the definition, and I should have, of grace. But let me just say this. Grace, I never understood this for the longest time as a Christian. And I know I'm giving you a lot of information, just I believe something's going to stick. Amen? The word grace, it does describe forgiveness, right? In other words, you don't deserve forgiveness. Some of this, sometimes mercy and grace are kind of overflowing with one another. But, but grace is forgiveness from God when you need forgiveness from God. But grace also is power from God. Power from God that gives people strength to walk with God. The the definition in the Strong's Greek Dictionary is that grace is a divine. What do you think of when you hear the word divine? Huh? Heavenly? God? Godly? Right? Grace is a, a divine, a godly, Grace is a divine influence on the heart, the inner man, and its reflection in the life. 
<laughs> Robert, like, not, Robert didn't say it. Brad used to say it, but Robert repeats it a lot. I don't know if he remembers it was Brad that said it, but my old pastor, Brad Bullock, used to say this. Grace is an inside job. See, it's not you working. If it's by works, then now a debt is owed to you. No, it's you believing and as you believe in Christ, grace is flowing into your life, and he's changing you on the inside it, to the point where the work is being done inwardly, but the reflection becomes outwardly. Like, in other words, oh, that person's acting like a believer. Now, Gandhi, what you going to say? When all the Christians start acting like Jesus, now what you going to say, Mr. Gandhi? You, you still want to come over now? Amen. All right, so anyway, that's just a thought. Poor Mr. Gandhi. All right. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's look at verse 19. I'm just breaking it down for you. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. We're talking about the sinful nature. We're talking about the first birth in Adam made us like our father with a sinful nature. So by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And let me just say this while we're talking about it. The people that say that alcoholism is a genetic whatever, that you receive the DNA from your father, it, alcohol, that ain't the problem, my friend. Alcoholism is not genetic. Drug addiction is not genetic. No, it's sin. Sin is genetic, spiritually speaking. You received it from your father, Adam. But don't believe what the psychologist tells you or what, or what the program tells you. I'm not buying it, dude. And listen, uh, <laughs> if people are going to get upset about this, I'm not trying to get people upset. But in AA or NA or whatever, what they try to tell you to do is they say, my name is such and such, and I'm an alcoholic. My name is such and such, and I'm a drug addict. Lies. Lies. No, not if you're a believer. Not if you're a believer. If you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, my name is Matt, and the Lord delivered me from that. Amen? My name is Matt, and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. So what are you trying to say, Mr. Moderator, that my Jesus isn't powerful enough to create a new being in me? No, I'm here to tell you he is. But by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And look at this. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Amen. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that word propitiation again, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He died for everybody. What does that word propitiation mean? It could mean something like this, sacrifice, payment, but importantly, satisfaction. What does that mean? God's anger was satisfied towards you because Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin, and now God can be satisfied with you because you received by faith the plan that he had, and you said, yes, Lord, come into my heart. Forgive me my sin, and you got to start believing that you are forgiven and that you are righteous, not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did. And your faith in that, hallelujah, will allow grace to flow in your life and change you. Amen? So by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. I just want to make a point here. Out of, outside of the Spirit of God, this is our position, our nature in Adam. You remember how I tell you our position is in Christ, but outside, if you're not saved, if you're outside of the Spirit of God, your position in Adam is this, sinner. All right, but look at this. I just thought this was clever. You may not think so. Look, let's get rid of this little prefix, dis. By one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Instead of outside of the Spirit, through the Spirit, this is our position in Christ. And a sinner, his nature is renewed. You're, the inside of who you are is being changed. I need you to understand that. You're not going to clean yourself up enough. I want to see you Sunday morning. Be here bright and early. Come in the back. Let's all pray and ask the Lord to move by his Spirit and change people's hearts. But if you don't show up Sunday, if you're a believer in Christ, guess what? You can still be being changed. Because your relationship with the Lord is not based on works and how many times you go to church. Oh, what are you trying to say, preacher? I don't have to come to church. Come on, man. I get sad every time the church isn't full. I want people in the church. 
I want people to want to be in the church. But at the same time, I'm not going to tell you a lie to try to coerce you to come to church. Come to church because you love Jesus. Come to church because you want to learn of the Lord. Amen? All right. So here's our nature. In Adam, we're fallen. In Christ, we're risen. Amen? That's good, right? Jesus rose from the dead. So our nature in Adam is that we're fallen. In Christ, it's that we're risen. I want to give you the scripture right here. Ephesians 4, 22, the old man. Put off concerning the former conversation. Look, I think I did that. I've had to put that because some people like the King James. But So I got to fix that for you. The word life, that's what conversation means. If, you're, if you don't know what the old King James means in conversation, you're going to be like, oh, I got to clean my talk up. Well, sometimes your talk is part of your life, but you need to understand that the old word in the King James conversation means life. Put off concerning your former life, the old man. The way your old man used to behave, the things he thought, the things he talked, the things he did, the places he went, the things he listened to. If you don't like that, then you don't like the gospel. Put off the old man. The old man is the one like, <laughs> I used to share this all the time, and I know I've heard Robert remind me about it sometimes, Weekend at Bernie's. Y'all remember that movie? Oh, Weekend at Bernie's, man. Like, if you ain't ever seen that movie, it was pretty, I don't know, it might have been bad. I can't tell the kids to go watch it, but... Like, Bernie died. They had a big old party planned, right? Bernie was rich, right? He had a big old pad, a big old house. All, everybody was coming to have a party. They couldn't shut the party down. They had to keep Bernie alive. So they put a hat on him, and they walked around, and they moved him around like he was a puppet. Bern, weekend at Bernie's. Look, sometimes our old man, we over here trying to, like, let him stay alive. And Jesus is saying, but I died so that he would die. Let the old man die. Quit going to the places that you used to go. Quit doing the things you used to do. Listen to me. Quit hanging around with the people you used to hang around with, my friend. I don't care if it's your mama, your daddy. I don't care if it's your brother, your sister. If they're offering you stuff that's jacking you up, you need to stay away because you're a new creation in Christ. I'm not preaching law. I'm trying to tell you that if you ain't ready to go over there and carry the cross up in the bar, and I don't, I'm not even saying I'm ready for that, but if you ain't ready to carry the cross up in the bar, slam it down like my old friend Lance Rao, God bless, rest, his, rest his soul, slamming that cross down in the middle of Bourbon Street and trying to tell people what for that they need Jesus in their life, if we ain't ready for that, then we ought to not be going to Bourbon Street. Why? Because we're going to do what we used to do on Bourbon Street. And what we used to do on Bourbon Street isn't godly behavior. It's old man behavior. Am I breaking it down for you good enough? I hope so. Because it was corrupt, the old man. But look, in this new life in Christ, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Oh, my gosh. I sent this to Aaron the other night. He said, dude, that's all Greek to me. <laughs> it's Greek. Because, see, what I wanted to try to accomplish tonight to some extent was to try to accomplish the concept of the sinful nature. I don't know if I still got an, an eraser up here. But we already talked about the fact that the, word, that the word sin in that verse of Scripture that we were talking about was being used as a noun, correct, and not a verb. I already tried to explain that. And I want you to know that <laughs> this little thing right here, you don't need to, this is not a Greek lesson. We're going to forget this maybe before we walk out of here. But look, see this word right here? Boom, it's two words. Ha homardia or he homardia. That, that word right there, sometimes it's, it looks like an O in the Greek. And right here, it looks kind of like an N. And then the word is what? Homardia, something like that. All right, ha homardia. This right here would be translated the. This right here would be translated sin. The sin. What is the purpose? Why are you even saying this, dude? You're making it so confusing. No, it's not. The definite article makes it a noun. It's a point that I'm trying to make. It's a proof that the word sin in the Greek text is a noun. So it's not describing acts of sin, shooting dice, you know, whatever we used to do. It's the, that's the factory. It's the power behind sin that forces, that drives people to do sinful activity. 
And so the new relationship in Christ, the old man that was being driven by the power of sin, the power of sin does not have power in the new man's life anymore because the grace of God is flowing through the righteousness of Jesus. So I need you to understand that in Christ, the, the normal relationship is not that we don't have power over sin. But what, the, what the Bible teaches is that we should be able to walk in victory because Jesus, when he died on the cross, gave us victory over the power of sin. But if we don't understand that and we put our faith in works or, put our, or go after things that we want instead of what God wants, it causes confusion in the spiritual realm. Does that make sense? And, and it causes trouble. Hopefully that made a little bit of sense. Now, one thing that I will tell you, uh, Mike's not here, but um, anybody watch the Marvel stuff or whatever? What was that last, that last one? With the, it was the Avengers? Is that what you call them? All them superheroes? What was that God's name? That Was it Thanos? Y'all remember? That word right there in the Greek is Thanato. It, it, words, it means death. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. All right. <laughs> As sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Another word for the word reigned could be power or influence, right? Because a king has power and exerts influence over his kingdom, right? And so what I want you to know is that in sin, power leads to death. And, and it influences towards death. But in Christ, the power results in eternal life. Amen? So look, here's these two people. Uh, well, I'd erase them off the board. But here's the guy. He's born of Adam. And here's this guy right here. He's a believer in Christ. I know we don't always walk around here with a big old smile on our face. But that's what we would hope, that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. Amen? All right, so this guy that's broken, he's born in Adam. And look, sin is his king. See, there's a king over him. And this guy here, he's born again in Christ in grace because, see, it says that, that through sin, it resulted in death. But through righteousness, grace will result in something different. So death is the end result of sin, right? I mean, oh, it felt so good when I first touched it, when I first smelled it, when I first kissed it, when I first tasted it, whatever, whatever, when I first heard it, whatever it was. Oh, it was so good, and it made this tintillating. Oh, my goodness. Like, you can feel it all over your senses, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. But in the end result, though, is death, right? Now, grace through righteousness results in life, eternal life. But I want to say this real quick because I think this is my last slide. I want to say this. Real quick, I want to say the grace of God working through the righteousness of Jesus, which was given to you as a gift because Jesus died on the cross and you believed by faith. That grace that's flowing through that righteousness gift not only will result in eternal life, it will result in abundant life today. Jesus said that the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. I want to encourage you tonight that Jesus has come to give us life more abundantly. Now, the last thing, I thought that was my last slide. Here we go. This is the last slide here. In order for the power of the sinful nature to be unplugged, two things must happen. Number one, at least two things, maybe more, but two for tonight. First of all, you must be born again. You, you have to be born again. John chapter 3, verse 3 says that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, nor can he enter into the kingdom of God. And Ephesians 1.13 says that when you heard the gospel, the good news, and you believed, that guess what? You were sealed with the spirit of promise. So if you can say tonight that something happened to you, that you've prayed a prayer where you invited Christ into your heart and you asked forgiveness of your sins and you know that you've never been the same since then, even if I didn't ask you if you never messed up again, that's not, that's ridiculousness. That's not reality. We all mess up. I'm trying to say that you felt different the, the next day when you messed up than you did before that day that you received Christ, then that's a good sign that you're born again. And if you're not born again, you can be born again. We'll pray tonight. Let's, amen? 
All right, but look, number two, your faith for victory must remain in him and his work. So as you're learning to live for God, you got to come to the realization, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't want to go there anymore. But Lord, I can't do it. I need you to do it for me. I need you to give me the strength. I want to, I want to partner with you, Lord. I want to serve you, but I need you to do it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this crowd tonight and those that will.